Awesome. So it, it seems like there will be more and more alternative data um, and, and alternative, um, I guess, delivery mechanisms of data, um, you know, coming up. Um, and, and, you know, it just makes me realize that, um, you know, um, maybe an Excel spreadsheet is not going to be very helpful here, right? So let's, let's kind of turn our, um, our eyes to like big data sourcing and, and scaling mechanisms. Um, Eddie, would you like to kind of get us started on, you know, how, how is data sourced, you know, how is it delivered to customers? What do they need in order to be able to access it and, and in order to make sense of it? Yeah, sure, thanks. Um, so it, it really starts at the very beginning when you're sourcing the data and you're doing your modeling and, and things like that. Like one of the biggest pain points that we've seen with investment management firms and, and even just large enterprises in general is when they're sourcing alternative data, they, they now have all these different teams and different data silos, we call them, looking at the data sets. They're all modeling the data. They're all defining their own fields. I don't know if you've experienced this, but like, you know, Two, two different teams will have their own definition of the same field, right? So there's no like really golden copy of the data anymore. Um, so the flexibility of the cloud is pretty much a double-edged sword in, in many ways. If you, if you don't have the right processing, processes in place, you'll essentially end up with data sprawl. Um, you'll, you'll have uh, trouble managing all the different data pipelines if you're dealing with you know, millions of alternative data sets, right? Like you, you're gonna have basically a nightmare to operate over. Um, you have, you're gonna, you have to make sure that all the data is like uh, recent and fresh. Um, and you, 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 you get into this scenario where um, there's a convergence of talent. So previously, in order to do data pipelines, and you would need someone who was just like a Python engineer or a software engineer, right? These days, you can actually, there are tools that enable you know, a data analyst with just SQL, SQL skills to be able to model data, set up their own ETL pipelines, things like that. And so there, there's sort of this push to move up the stack to enable a domain expert with business knowledge to do their own ETL, to do their own like data management and things like that without needing this sort of back and forth telephone game where they submit a request to a software engineering team, software engineering team puts in a ticket, you know, in Jira, puts it in the queue and then so on and so forth. So. There, there's, there's, a, there's a huge convergence into managed services. Managed services are really allowing, you know, an analyst with a financial services background to do analysis, to do things that they weren't able to do before. Um, Awesome, and, and I know we'll touch on you know how teams are structured as well and how that has changed, so stay tuned for that part. But I um, wanted to um, ask the same question to Anthony, actually. Yeah, I would say that um, you know, pulling, pulling the, uh, the technologies that used to reside kind of behind the scenes in the operations layer of, of data, bringing them forward uh, into a user experience that, like, like you were saying, someone with Python or development skills can kind of put that to work. Uh, that's been maybe most beneficial for us, um, especially with our analytics lab uh, product that we just launched. Um, I, I would say also, you know, how we've used, uh, say, machine learning and um, natural language generation is really to augment and extend the work that our analysts do, right? So as a human analyst, you can only cover so many sectors and so many stocks, right? So it's pretty natural that you'd use machine learning and natural language generation to kind of augment and extend their coverage. And that's what we've done. We've had that in play for maybe uh, almost 10 years now. And, uh, and that's been really successful so that an investor could look at a human covered stock and see what Morningstar would think, but also look at a, you know, a small cap, micro cap company to see if you were to run it through the same models, what would it look like uh, if an analyst, a human analyst covered it? So that's been helpful for us to kind of bring forward the tools that kind of resided behind the scenes and more front and center. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, speaking of AI ML, um, amenity, maybe um, a, a bit of a, a glimpse into that and, and how it, um, you know, helps scale. Sure. So I think, you know, we're seeing a lot of pressure at our clients to, to do more with less, uh, especially on the sell side, uh, where there is, 
you know, still the, the pull, like Anthony mentioned, to cover more companies and do it with less people. And that's driving a lot of demand for, for automation, you know, which, is, which is where we come in. You know, there are certain use cases, you know, one actually we work with, with NASDAQ on, where we monitor uh, all of the SEC filings that are issued by NASDAQ listed companies to try and identify when those companies have disclosed something that's in violation of the NASDAQ listing requirements. And this was a task that was previously done by simply hitting control F through tens of thousands of documents every year, looking for one of 50 things that might be disclosed in any one of those documents. Um, and we've been able to, to automate that. We've been able to deliver them that th those data points at human levels of accuracy, in some cases above human levels of accuracy, so that they can put their analysts on higher value tasks. They can spend their time reviewing the violations instead of trying to find them. And it's increased efficiency uh, in, a, in a tremendous way. And so we're seeing a lot of our clients try and identify those tasks that can be automated and that they can use you know, then that data uh, in order to drive a business process or a workflow that's just more efficient and more effective. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think your value in, you know, um, basically removing technical barriers to uh, productivity and to like insights is uh, is something that, you know, I, I personally based my career off of and, and, and I'm really glad to see, you know, solutions like these, like really helping, you know, portfolio managers become more effective and also more consistent in, in their work. But speaking of portfolio managers, wanted to um, to touch on how, um, how teams have changed their structure. And whether this is like due to the pandemic, whether this is through, um, you know, due to the natural progression of technology becoming more available. Um, Eddie, I, I know you have an opinion on, on this one. Yeah, yeah, so, so tip, like a lot of the funds that we're dealing with will have a, a pod model where, you know, you know, individual PMs will manage their own books. Um, some will rely on a central IT team. What we're seeing is this kind of proliferation of, of these individual teams being able to take into, take into their own hands their own, um, their own tech stack, essentially, which, which they consider as part of their IP as well. Um, another thing that's really interesting here is um, data utilization. So these, these individual teams, they, they want to know like, what data uh, is being used by each of the different teams so they can do accounting as well. So the central IT team will essentially do um, some sort of accounting and track the, the API usage and the data usage among each of the teams to see which uh, portfolio managers are required to pay for certain data sets as well. So we're, we're kind of seeing this distributed management of all the different PM teams, uh, but also this enabling of the different PM teams as well and allowing PM teams to function without requiring, you know, a software engineer, infrastructure engineer, cloud engineer to help them do their job. So that, that, that's really what we're seeing. Awesome. Um, if anybody else wants to opine, please go for it. Well, I, I would say that the, the role of a, of a data, data leader uh, in a traditional hedge fund, especially in the, the long short or event space, has become uh, the price of admission. Uh, and I, a lot of cases, you know, data is only as good as you can make sense of it. And, you know, as we've seen this proliferation of new data sources, of new ways of, of looking at companies, a lot of analysts and portfolio managers have been left behind. They simply have their way of doing business. It's worked for them over time, increasingly less well, but it has worked, and they don't want to change it. And how are they used to consuming information? having someone put it on a silver platter for them. And honestly, that's what's most efficient. And so that role is now being filled by, by these data teams. And the most effective ones develop the methodologies that they can take their, those insights to those analysts, to those portfolio managers in a simple way as possible so that they can understand what new information might be impacting their, their names and their portfolios.